American Institute of Mathematics, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Manjul Bhargava this morning. Manjul got his bachelor's degree from Harvard in 1996 and uh, was awarded the Frank and Brenny Morgan Prize for research by an undergraduate, one of uh, many prizes he's received. He got his PhD from Princeton in uh, 2001 under the direction of Andrew Wiles. <clears throat> Uh, in 1801, Gauss had found uh, composition laws for uh, binary quadratic forms that showed there was a group structure there. And Manjul, uh, <coughs> 2000, sorry, 200 years later uh, to the year, found higher composition laws in his uh, thesis. Uh, he was awarded a Clay uh, Fellowship and two years later became a full professor at uh, Princeton University, uh, one of the youngest ever full professors at Princeton. He's won uh, quite a number of prizes. Uh, the uh, Sastra Ramanujan Prize <clears throat> in 2005, the Cole Prize in 2008, uh, Fermat Prize in 2011, the Infosys Prize in 2012, and uh, just last year, he received a prestigious uh, Simons Investigator Award. That's a 10-year grant for $100,000 a year to further his research program. And uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Manjul Bhargava, who will talk to us about rational points on elliptic and hyperelliptic curves. Uh, at this first meeting, Mathematical Congress of the Americas. And as Professor Dobishi said earlier in the week, uh, it's also my hope that this is the first of many uh, to come in the future. What I want to talk about today is a very basic question uh, in my subject, number theory, namely that of understanding and finding rational points on elliptic and hyperelliptic curves. So in more elementary terms, I'm interested, I want to talk about finding square values of polynomials, square number values of polynomials. So of course polynomials are uh, well, one of the most basic objects of mathematics uh, in all areas of mathematics. Uh, and, and square numbers are of course uh, one of the most fundamental sequences in number theory. And so we're interested in polynomials, the way they come up in, in throughout mathematics. Uh, one is interested in understanding spaces of polynomials, rings of polynomials. Uh, in particular, one likes to understand how to approximate functions by polynomials. And of course, one is therefore interested in the values of polynomials. And for a number theorist, that question includes understanding whether a polynomial, the set of values taken by a polynomial, include square numbers, square numbers being one of the most fundamental sequences of number theory, uh, fundamental sequences of whole numbers. OK, so the question is that of looking for square numbers, okay, taken by polynomials or other mathematical expressions. And this problem about understanding square numbers taken by mathematical expressions is one that goes back thousands of years. Uh, in fact, it goes, goes back maybe even 4,000 years or more. So a continually recurring theme in number theory since ancient times is when is and how often is a mathematical expression uh, a square number. So one of the very first examples seems to have arisen uh, maybe around 2500 BC uh, in the construction of what are known as the megalithic monuments uh, in northern Europe and in Egypt. So these huge stone structures that uh, were made, they often contained huge right triangles whose side lengths were integers in terms of a fundamental unit that they used at the time. So in other words, the monument builders were interested in solving the equations c squared equals a squared plus b squared <laughs> in integers a, b, and c. And it's, so of course, this is, this is all guesswork. They, they never wrote this down, but when one looks at these megalithic monuments, it's, it's quite convincing that this is what they were looking for. But of course, none of their solutions were actually written, written down, but you can see them in stone. Uh, the first time 
So they were actually constructed in stone. The first time that we've seen something written down that still survives today is in the Plimpton 322 tablet. So this goes back to at least 1800 BC. And this is a Mesopotamian tablet, a Babylonian tablet known as Plimpton 322. And it listed numerous such triples A, B, C, such that C squared equals A squared plus B squared. Uh, and here are some examples. So this was written down on a clay tablet uh, in 1800 BC. And as you can see, some of these solutions to A squared plus B squared equals C squared are quite large. Uh, the middle one there has five digits, each of the A, B, and C are five digits long. So it seems that they didn't just find these experimentally, they must have had some method or formula for finding such triples uh, in a systematic manner. Uh, it would be sort of hard to come up with these just ad hoc. And this is, this is back in 1800 BC. So they were looking for square values of A squared plus B squared. And, and they found many such solutions. Uh, of course, they didn't write uh, these solutions in these numerals. Here, here's what the tablet actually looks like. Uh, it's kept at, uh, at the Columbia University uh, uh, Museum. This is the Plimpton 322 tablet. So these are, the, these are exactly the solutions that I wrote out on this slide here. And of course, many other cultures, after 1800 BC, many other cultures found explicit methods of finding solutions to A squared plus B squared equals C squared, uh, including in India and in China, and also in Southern Mexico and Central America, uh, in the long counting calendar of the Mayans, uh, the factoring triples A squared plus B squared equals C squared, the solutions and integers uh, were known also in the Americas prior to, prior to the Tigers. So, as I said, so some early examples of mathematical expressions being a square, trying to find square solutions to mathematical expressions. The first one, of course, is in terms of the Pythagorean theorem, when this A squared is B squared square, which was studied in many cultures for thousands of years uh, prior to Pythagoras, and then, of course, at the Pythagorean school. Uh, another very famous example of a square equation is that of Pell's equation. So, that's the question for a fixed end, how can one find all square values of n y squared plus or minus 1? So if n is fixed, and you want to understand for what values of y is n times y squared plus 1, or n times y squared minus 1, going to be a square. And so this was also studied by many cultures. Uh, this is the theorem of Gupta from about the 6th century, that if you take a non-square value of n, then ny squared plus 1 and ny squared minus 1 uh, has, always has infinitely many solutions. And there's an explicit way to find them all. So that also goes back over a thousand years. Uh, and a more modern example, only a few hundred years old, is Fermat's equation. Uh, so Fermat showed, well, this was one of the first examples of Fermat's last theorem that was proven. Uh, it was proven by Fermat. And what he showed is that the expression a to the fourth plus b to the fourth never takes a square value. So in particular, a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c to the fourth does not have a solution. But he proved something stronger. He showed that a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c squared, in fact, doesn't have a solution. And of course, this equation has had a lot of influence over the years, too, in the context of Fermat's last theorem. So all three of these, of course, Pythagorean theorem, Paul's equation, Fermat's equation, and there are many other examples. But these, are, these three uh, examples and many others have played a very important role throughout the history of mathematics, not just in number theory, but but in many other related branches of mathematics. And in fact, they're still very, very important today. Uh, just to give you an example of, of where some of these equations have been used in, in other fields, Pell's equation comes up uh, in logic a lot of the time. It was used, Pell's equation, solutions to Pell's equation were used by Massasevich in his, uh, in his resolution of Hilbert's 10th problem uh, in logic. Uh, here's a more recent example, just from the last century, of, of an, an attempt to understand when a mathematical expression takes, takes a square value. Make sure you fix this. Okay. Uh, so in 1913, Ramanujan posed the following as a problem in the Journal of the Indian Math Society. So he wanted to understand so here, this is the problem he put, he said, it's called Ramanujan's square problem. He wanted to 
Now, what are the values of n such that 2 to the n minus 7 is a square? And the problem we posed was that showed that all values of n such that 2 to the n minus 7 is a square. These are the values. <laughs> 3, 4, 5, 7, and 15. So you can see that these, in fact, do give square values, right? 2 cubed minus 7 is 1, which is 1 squared. 2 to the 4 minus 7 is 3 squared, right? 9. Uh, and then same for 2 to, the, uh, 2 to the 5 minus 7 is 5 squared. Right? 2 to the 7 minus 7 is 11 squared. And of course, 2 to the 15 minus 7 is 32,761, which is, of course, 181 squared. <laughs> So this is, this is a question posed by Raman, and that these are all solutions, are there any other solutions? And this was not solved for uh, many years, but it was finally solved by Nagel in 1948, using methods of dead anti analysis. And, but this problem that was, that was posed back in 1913 continues to, to generally, uh, generate a lot of uh, research uh, in related fields. Uh, so this equation, y squared equals 2 to the n minus 7, is called an exponential Dadmantian equation because one of the main variables, namely n, is in the exponent. And that makes things a lot harder. So equations in general of the form y squared equals a to the n minus b for fixed a and b uh, are called equations of Ramanujan and Nagel type. And what is understood now is that when a equals 2, say, so if we just look, so a and b are fixed, and we're looking at solutions to y squared equals a to the n minus b if variables are n and y. And when a equals 2, it's now known that there can be at most two solutions to y squared equals a to the n minus b, unless b equals 7. <laughs> and then there are 5. And so Ramanujan's example was, was, the, was the unique example where you get more than two solutions, and in fact you get five solutions in that case. Uh, but the kind of question I want to ask in today's lecture is what do you expect typically if you choose a random equation? How many solutions do you expect? So for example, in this case, one would expect that normally you don't have any solutions. If you ask a to the n minus b to be a square, you don't expect that to be squared very often. You probably to fix such an equation at random, you expect no solutions. So the question is, are there usually zero solutions to equations of Ramanujan and Miguel type? And that's the kind of question that I want to address today. But I don't want to go all the way to exponential that into equations. Uh, I want to stick to polynomials. So when you ask for uh, a polynomial to be a square, that leads to a kind of equation which is called the hyperelliptic curve. So instead of exponential definition equations, the simplest type of square equation, you know, and then a square equation is one where you're asking for a mathematical expression to be square. The simplest type of square equation is one where we wish to determine whether a polynomial in one variable takes a square value. So an equation in x and y of the form y squared equals a polynomial in x. Okay, one, one variable polynomial in x. So an equation of that form is called a hyperelliptic curve. And the reason it's called a hyperelliptic curve is that if you, if you graph it in the plane, in the xy plane, uh, it traces out a curve. And the hyperelliptic refers to the fact that uh, it's symmetric. If you graph this equation in at the xy plane, it's symmetric about the x-axis. Right? Because if x comma y is a solution, then x comma minus y is also a solution. And that's what the hyperelliptic refers to. Okay? So an equation in x and y from y squared equals f of x uh, is called the hyperelliptic curve. And we're interested in integer solutions uh, to such equations. Okay? So if you have a solution to y squared equals f of x, that's called a point on the curve. Because if you were to graph this curve, then a solution to this equation would be a point on that curve, on the graph. So instead of solutions to y squared equals f of x, number theorists often talk about points on the curve. It's equivalent. And so we're interested in finding all integral solutions to y squared equals f of x. That is all integral values of x for which f of x is a square. Uh, more generally, we can ask for all rational solutions to y squared equals f of x, namely where x and y are not necessarily integers, but are rational numbers. And these correspond to rational points on the hyperelliptic curve, namely points on the hyperelliptic curve where the coordinates, both coordinates, are rational. Okay, so that's the fundamental object that I want to talk about today, and I want to talk about rational solutions to, to such objects. So y squared equals f of x will be the kind of equation that we're interested in. 
hey, when is the polynomial taking a square value? And we're interested in rational solutions and energy field solutions. And rational solutions to this equation are also called rational points on the hyperelliptic curve. The hyperelliptic curve is just the graph of y squared equals f of x. Okay. Okay, so that's the fundamental object uh, that I want to talk about. And so the basic question is, how many rational points uh, can the hyperelliptic curve y squared equals f of x have? So if you, if you have some degree m polynomial f in x with rational coefficients or integer coefficients, how many times does it take a square value on the integers or on the rational numbers? Uh, more generally, we can ask how many rational points a general algebraic curve has. So if you take a polynomial in two variables, h of x, y, and set it equal to zero, how many rational solutions are there? How many rational points are on that curve? Okay, if you take any polynomial in two variables, h, the polynomial that we were considering earlier is y squared minus f of x. We were asking that to be zero, but in general, you could take any polynomial in two variables, and you can ask how many rational points are on h of x, y equals zero. And this question about the possible number of solutions to such an equation, polynomial in two variables set equal to zero, this has a beautiful answer uh, in terms of the graph of, of the equation h of x, y equals zero. If you have to do this graphing, not in R2, the way we normally do uh, in school, uh, in high school, but you should graph it over the complex numbers. So of course, we don't always do this in school. We usually graph it on, on, in R2 uh, because our paper is two-dimensional. But if we lived in a four-dimensional world or a five-dimensional world and we had four-dimensional paper, the natural place to graph, the natural place to graph equations that form h of x, y equals zero would be in C2. The reason being that C is algebraically closed, while R often doesn't have solutions to, uh, to polynomial equations. It doesn't have a full set of solutions. OK, so the, the answer to this question about how many rational solutions you have to an equation from h of x, y equals 0 is very much tied to the topology of the graph of h of x, y equals 0 in, in C2 and the complex number squared. And so I want to explain that for a second, because this is one of the really beautiful connections between number theory and, and other areas of mathematics, particularly topology. Okay, so to state this answer about how many rational solutions you can have to a polynomial equation in two variables, uh, we need the notion from topology uh, of the genus of an algebraic curve. Okay, so let's recall that when you graph an algebraic curve f of x, y equals zero in R2, you get a curve-like figure in the plane. And that's the reason why this object is called an algebraic curve. You graph h of x, y equals zero, where h is a polynomial in two variables, in R2, you get a curve-like figure. So it's called an algebraic curve. But many mathematicians now regret this terminology because the correct place, as I said, to graph the curve f of x, y equals 0 is not in R2, but in C2. And in that case, the graph that you would get uh, is not a curve, but a surface. So the reason, as I said, the way we don't do this in school is that C2 is sort of hard to visualize for all of us who live in a three-dimensional world. But it's not so bad even though we live in a three-dimensional world, because even though you're graphing in, in C2, which is a four-dimensional, sort of a real four-dimensional space, the graph of h of x, y equals zero, it's not a curve, but it's a surface. It's a surface in four dimensions, but at the end, it is a surface, which is two-dimensional. And so you can still visualize what a two-dimensional thing looks like. So the graph of h of x, y equals 0 in C2 is going to be a surface, not a curve. And we can try to understand what that surface looks like. And that leads to the notion of the genus of a curve. So if you take the graph of an algebraic curve, f of x, y equals 0 in C2, then topologically, so the theorem is that any algebraic curve, when you graph it in C2, is topologically going to look like a surface with g handles. Which uh, so sort of the, the pulling together of G donuts with perhaps finite many points removed. So, finite. so it'll look like uh, a gluing together of G donuts with perhaps some punk, finitely many punctures in it. And that's what topologically the graph of an algebraic curve, f of x, y equals 0 in C2, looks like. And so you can sort of classify algebraic curves by how many holes, donut holes, they have uh, when you graph the curve when you graph the equation in C2. 
So this number G, this number of holes, this number of donut holes occurring in the theorem is called the genus of the curve. So here's what the graphs in C2 of algebraic curves of genus 0, 1, and greater than equal to 3 would look like. So it would look more or less like that. So the first object there is the surface of a sphere. It has zero holes. And so that's called genus 0. If you graph your equation f of x equals y and you find you have one donut hole that looks like a donut, that's called genus 1. Uh, and in general, if you find that you have g donut holes, that would be an algebraic curve of genus g. Okay, so this is a purely topological notion. Uh, we're just graphing a polynomial with two variables, in C2, and we count the number of donut holes we have, and that's a topological notion. And the amazing thing is that that number of donut holes, which is a topological notion, actually says a lot about the structure of rational points, the structure of rational solutions to f of x, y equals zero. And this is sort of one of the amazing uh, connections between number theory and topology that this topological notion of genus should have any connection to the structure of rational points, which is a number theoretic object. So the genus is related to the structure of rational points. So the significance is the following theorem, that if you take the set of rational points, okay, the set of rational solutions, to a two-variable polynomial whose graph in C2 has genus G, has G donut holes. So that set of rational points uh, on an algebraic curve of genus G is either empty or infinite if the genus is zero. Okay, so if we're going to be graphing, you get the surface of a sphere. If you graph your equation f of x, y equals zero, and you get the surface of a sphere, then the number of rational points is either zero or infinity. Okay, the number of rational solutions would be either zero or infinity. If there's one donut hole, uh, in other words, if g equals one, then the set of rational points is either finite or infinite. <laughs> That's not saying very much. If the genus is more than one, in other words, when you graph your equation in C2 and you find more than one donut hole, then the number of rational solutions will definitely be finite. And this, of course, is famous Mordell's conjecture, proven by Faltings in 1983, Faltings theorem. So there's, there's sort of three situations. If genus is zero, then, there, then the set of rational solutions is either empty or infinite. When the genus is one, you can't say anything. It could be either finite or infinite. And when the genus is bigger than one, then you definitely have only finite and many solutions. So the topology, the number of donut holes, after you graph the equation, that's telling you something about the structure of rational points. So that's what's truly remarkable about this theorem, is that it relates the genus to the topological invariant of the locus of solutions over C, over the complex numbers, to the structure of rational points, in other words, the solutions over Q, the rational numbers. Uh, I should say that this theorem is effective in the case of g equals zero. In other words, if, you're, if you have an algebraic equation f of x, y equals zero, and you graph it, you find those, uh, no holes, then that means that you can actually, there is an algorithm to find all the solutions or to prove that there are no solutions in the case of g is zero. But this theorem is ineffective still uh, for genus one and genus bigger than one. There's no known algorithm to determine how many rational points a curve has no general algorithm to determine how many rational points a curve has when the genus is at least one. And in particular, when the genus is one, it's not known. Remember in the genus one case, this theorem wasn't saying very much. And in fact, even for specific equations, it's not known in general how to determine whether a genus one algebraic equation, genus one algebraic curve, has finitely or infinitely many rational points. There's no algorithm known to decide which case you're in. Although the Birch and Spooner Kandair conjecture gives a conjectural answer. And that's one of the reasons of the importance of the Birch and Spooner Kandair conjecture. It settles uh, the question of whether you have finite and many or infinitely rational points uh, in the smallest genus case, uh, where we don't yet know how to determine how many rational points exist on the curve. OK, so for genus 0, it's effective. We can determine whether the set of rational points is empty or infinite. When the genus is 1, the number of rational points could be finite or infinite, and there's no known algorithm to tell which case you're in. And if the genus is bigger than 1, then, then it's guaranteed by Faltzing's theorem that there are only finite and many rational points, but there's no known algorithm to decide how many that finite number is. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, status of understanding how many rational points are on specific curves. 
Okay, so let's go back to the case of hyperelliptic curves. So hyperelliptic curves are a special case of the equation h of x, y equals zero, where h of x, y looks like y squared minus f of x, where f of x is a polynomial in one variable. Uh, and it's not hard to visualize. If you graph y squared equals f of x, it's not hard to visualize what the graph would look like uh, in C2, and, and to decide how many holes you'll get when you graph it in C2. That's the genus of the curve. Uh, so it's not hard to visualize. It does compute the genus of any hyperelliptic curve. And what you find is that if you take y squared equals f of x, that defines a hyperelliptic curve. Uh, suppose f of x has degree m. Then the genus of the curve, in other words, the number of donut holes you get when you graph y squared equals f of x in C2, that genus g of the curve is given by the integer part of m minus 1 over 2. m is the degree of f of x. So it's roughly half the degree uh, of f of x. And it's interesting to try to visualize that uh, in C2. It's not too hard. So this means specifically for small degrees, if f has degree 1 or 2, then the hyperelliptic curve is g is 0. So in other words, they're going to be either 0 or infinitely many rational points in that case. Uh, if it, the degree of f is 3 or 4, then the genus is 1. And if it has degree 5 or 6, then the genus is 2, and so on. So one or two, degree 1 or 2 gives genus 0, degree 3 or 4 gives genus 1, degree 5 or 6 gives genus 2, and so on. And so a corollary from the theorem on the previous page, right? The corollary is that suppose f of x has degree m, then the set of rational points on hyperelliptic curve y squared equals f of x is either empty or infinite. If m equals 1 or 2, right, that's the genus 0 case. It's either finite or infinite, this is the case where we're not saying anything at all. Uh, if m equals 3 or 4, and it's definitely finite if m is greater than equal to 5. That's a consequence of Faulting's theorem. Okay. So the degree corresponds roughly to the genus, the degree over 2 corresponds roughly to the genus, and, and therefore that tells you about the structure of rational points. So when the degree is very small, 1 or 2, you either have no rational points or you have infinite many. The degree is 3 or 4, you can't say anything at all. When, but once the degree is at least 5, you know that there are only going to be finitely many rational solutions to y squared equals f of x. So that's what the general results on algebraic curves tell us in the case of hyperelliptic curves. You just have to look at the degree. And once the degree is at least 5, you know that there are only finitely many rational points. And as I said, in the case of degree 1 or 2, there are known algorithms to find all the rational points, and you can prove that there are no rational points, or you can find all of them. But once the degree, once the genus is at least 1, in other words, once the degree of f of x is at least 3, we don't know how to, to find all the rational points. But we can say that there are definitely finite and many once the degree is 5. But how big that finite number is, is still ineffective. And there's no known algorithm to decide for a given equation. OK. So the smallest case, then, that we don't understand is m equals 3. So do, when y squared equals f of x, where f of x has degree 3. And that's the case of elliptic curves. Uh, those are called elliptic curves. So remember, degree 1 and 2, we know how to do because that's genus 0. What's the genus is 1, which is the case when m is at least 3. Uh, we don't know what's going on uh, as far as finding all rational points. And the smallest case is m equals 3. Those are called elliptic curves. And that's why elliptic curves sort of have played a very major role uh, in number theory. It's the smallest case that we still really don't understand. So an elliptic curve over Q is a genus 1 curve that has an equation of the form y squared equals a cubic polynomial in x. Okay. And so the a0, a1, a2, a3, the coefficients of that cubic polynomial are rational numbers. Or without loss of generality, you can make assume that they're integers just by doing a change of variable in x and y. Just multiplying them here, multiplying out the denominators. Okay, so we're going to look at equations of the form y squared equals a cubic polynomial in x, where the coefficients are integers. So this case of elliptic curves is very special for a number of reasons. First of all, it's the first case where we don't know in general how to find all rational solutions. And secondly, it's the only case where the set of rational points on the curve has an extra structure, namely an extra group structure. You take the set of rational points on elliptic curves. On an elliptic curve, it turns out they form a group in a natural way. And so I'd like to concentrate on that, on this case, for, for a few minutes. So this case where y squared equals f of x, f of x has degree 3. So this case is very important graph mathematics. Uh, the graph of an elliptic curve tends to look like one of the following two pictures. If you graph it in R2, it tends to look like one of these two pictures. Uh, 
The first picture is why squared equals x cubed minus x. Uh, the reason that the picture looks like that in that case is that x cubed minus x has three real roots. Whereas the picture on the right is y squared equals x cubed plus x. Uh, that only has one real root, namely at zero, and that's why the picture looks like that. And so a, a cubic polynomial will either have one real root or three real roots, and so it'll tend to look like either the picture on the left, if you have three real roots, or the picture on the right, if your polynomial f of x has only one real root. So that's what the graph in R2 looks like. When you graph it in C2, of course, this is a, as I said, this is a genus 1 case, so it's going to look like the surface of a donut uh, when you graph it in C2. Okay, so that's what the graph in the elliptic curve looks like. And here's the amazing thing about elliptic curves, is that if one has two rational points on a plane elliptic curve, then the line connecting the two rational points intersects the elliptic curve in a third rational point. So in other words, given rational points P and Q on your elliptic curve, you can define a rational point P plus Q on E as follows. So what you do is you take, so you have your points P and Q, you can take the line connecting P and Q, it's going to intersect your elliptic curve in the third point, and you reflect that across the x-axis. Remember, all these hyperelliptic curves have the property that they're symmetric about the x-axis. So you take the line that connects your rational point P and your rational point Q, and it's going to intersect your elliptic curve at a third point, and you reflect that across the x-axis. And you call that P plus Q. Okay, that's a way of defining uh, a composition of two points. You take two points, and you produce a third point. So you take two points P and Q, this, this method where you connect the points by line, look at the third point of intersection with your elliptic curve, and then reflect it across the x-axis. That we call P plus Q. And one checks that together with the point at infinity as the identity. The point at infinity is the point that's all the way up there, uh, or equivalently all the way down there, those are identified in the projected plane. <laughs> if you call that point the identity, then with that point as the identity, this law of addition endows a set of rational points on your elliptic curve with the structure of an abelian group. So P plus Q is equal to Q plus P. That's pretty clear by the definition, because you're just taking the, the line that intersects your two points, looking at the third point of intersection, and reflecting it. doesn't matter uh, whether you talk about P plus Q then or P plus P, so it's clearly something abelian. What's less clear is that it's a group, that it's associated. But amazingly, this uh, law of addition uh, has the property that P plus Q plus R is equal to P plus Q plus R in the two ways that you can put parentheses there. Okay, so this endows the structure of rational points uh, with the structure of an abelian group. So the rational points on an elliptic curve, in other words, the rational solutions to y squared equals a cubic polynomial, naturally form a group, an abelian group. And that's something that's very special for degree three uh, curves. And what do we know about the structure of this abelian group? Uh, that's so the main structure theorem is called Mordell's theorem. And what it says is that, uh, so if you, take all, if you take the group of rational points on your elliptic curve E, it's called E of Q. One thing I should have said on the previous page is that P and Q are rational points. In other words, if they have rational coordinates, then P plus Q, one text, also has rational coordinates. So it's really, it really gives you a, a group structure on a set of rational points, the points that have rational coordinates. So that group of rational points on your elliptic curve is denoted by E of Q. And the main structure theorem about this abelian group E of Q is that it's finitely generated. So it's a finitely generated abelian group. Uh, a way to say that in elementary terms without saying using group theory is just to say there's a finite set of points uh, that you can start with on your elliptic curve such that you can generate all rational points by playing with connect the dots procedure, where you connect two points, look at the third point of intersection, then connect two more points, look at the point of intersection. You'll be able to generate all rational points that way just by starting with a finite set. That's what Mordell's theorem is saying, that the group E of Q of rational points on E is finitely generated. You only need to start with finitely many rational points, and you can use just those finitely many rational points to produce all rational points uh, by this, additional, this addition procedure that we just described. Okay, so this finite, this abelian group, E of Q, a set of rational points on E, is a finitely generated abelian group. And as we learned in undergraduate algebra, uh, if you have a finitely generated abelian group, then you can write it as a product of cyclic groups, a finite product of cyclic groups. So in other words, E of Q, this group of rational points on 
the elliptic curve is isomorphic to a, to a product of infinite cyclic groups, say R of them, times some, uh, some finite abelian group. It's called T. So, the, so E of Q is isomorphic to C to the R times T, where R is some finite integer, some negative integer, and T is some finite abelian group. And one can show that this finite abelian group T is usually pretty small. It's a theorem of Bayer that this group T is bounded in size by 16. And in fact, most of the time, it just has size 1. Okay. So there's not much going on over there. And so it's really, E of Q most of the time is basically it looks like Z to the R, where Z is the infinite cyclic group. And so it's that quantity R that measures how big your set of rational points is. So R measures how big the group E of Q is. If R is 0, that means that E of Q is finite. You're only finite to many rational points on your elliptic curve. If R is at least 1, then there are infinitely many points on your elliptic curve. And how big R is tells you how infinite that set of rational points is. So R equals 1 is just your basic infinite, but R equals 2 is kind of even more infinite, and so on. So R measures how big the group E of Q is, and R equals 0 versus R not equal to 0 is what tells you whether you're finite to many or infinitely many rational points. And how big R is if you're at least one tells you how infinite your group of rational points is. So this quantity R is the basic invariant of the set of rational points on the elliptic curve, and that's called the rank of the very important invariant. Now that's used throughout number theory, number of different number theory problems. But the rank of E therefore measures the number of points needed to generate all rational points on the curve. And by Mordell's theorem, this number is always finite, and that's the quantity R. Of the rank. Okay, so the rank R measures how big your set of rational points is on your elliptic curve. R equals zero corresponding to the case where you only have, have finite many rational points. Okay, so for the degree three case, therefore, we'd like to understand the behavior of this rank R. So we want to understand how big do we expect typically this this invariant R to be. Do we usually expect R to be zero? In which case, we would say we usually expect finitely many rational points. Do we expect R to be at least one a lot of the time? In which case, we expect infinitely many points a lot of the time. What is the distribution of R? So to make that question precise, we have to order all of the curves in a certain way so that we can sample them and then ask, what is the distribution of R? So recall that elliptic curve is defined by a cubic equation. Y squared equals a cubic polynomial in X, where these coefficients are integers. And we can define the height of E, okay, the height of this cubic equation, by the size of the coefficients of the defining equation. So in other words, we'll define the height H of E to be the maximum of the absolute values of the coefficients of that cubic problem. Okay, the maximum of the absolute values of A0, A1, A2, and A3. Okay, and then you can look at all cubic polynomials of height at most a million, and look at y squared equals those cubic polynomials, and compute what the rank is. And then we can ask, what is the distribution of the rank as that height function goes to infinity? Okay, that makes that question precise about the distribution of R. I should mention that there, there are various other notions of height of the elliptic curves. This is the simplest one. This is the simplest one. If you're writing down random cubic equations, this is sort of how you would think. Uh, this is called uh, just the regular height. But there are other notions of height of the elliptic curves, such as uh, the faulting height, the discriminant, and the conductor. Uh, and what I want to remark is that any of these notions of height could be used instead uh, for the questions that we're asking, but they're not expected to change any of the answers. Uh, and in fact, all these notions of height are more or less equivalent uh, uh, if you assume standard conjectures. Uh, in any case, they don't change any of the answers. So let's just use the simplest notion of height. Namely, we're just going to take the maximum of the absolute value of the coefficients. We're going to take, order all of the curves by height, and we're going to ask, how does this rank, this fundamental invariant rank, uh, vary as we vary across all of the curves? Okay, and in particular, we can ask, what is the average rank? As, so, as we're varying across the elliptic curve, we're getting various different values of r. We can ask, what is the average size of r? So, if all elliptic curves over q are ordered by their heights, what is the average size of the rank? And do we expect it to be near zero? In this case, that would say that most curves have finite many rational points. Uh, or do we expect R to be very big if we're going to infinity? Uh, in which case, elliptic curves would tend to have lots of rational points. Well, the conjecture, the standard conjecture in this area is that the average rank, average size of R as you vary across elliptic curves, should be one half. 
And more precisely, one expects that 50% of all curves uh, have rank 0, and 50% of curves have rank 1. And the remaining 0% of curves have rank 2 or more. So remember, 0% of curves can still be an infinite set, but it will be very sparse. So the conjecture is that about half of curves have rank 0, and half of curves have rank 1. So in other words, half of all curves, the conjecture is that half of all curves have finite many rational points, half of all elliptic curves have infinite many rational points. Okay, that's the conjecture, that the average rank should be a half. Average size of R should be a half. Uh, however, previously this average has not even been known uh, to be finite, uh, let alone a half. Uh, at least not unconditionally. Uh, I should also say that computations don't give much support to this conjecture. Uh, for example, it was observed by Prumer and McGinnis in their 1990 computations uh, that rank 2 curves uh, occur surprisingly often. And in fact, they occur with increasing frequency as, as you uh, take bigger and bigger coefficients in your elliptic curve. And these computations were extended recently by Vectarima, Stein, and Watkins. And so I want to show you a graph that comes from their data which graphs, so as you go to higher and higher heights of elliptic curves, it graphs what the average size of the rank is. We expect it to be a half. Um, and here's what, their, here's what their graph shows. So as you can see, so this is, so we're going, where it's actually ordered by conductor, but it, the, the graph looks similar to ordered by height. And so it starts at about 100,000, and it says, and as you can see, as you go up to all elliptic curves which conductor 100,000, uh, the average rank is already bigger than a half starts already at 0.7. And then it just gets bigger. The average rank is just increasing uh, as you go up to uh, conductor 100 million. Uh, and it's not clear whether it's an approaching an asymptote, which is clear that it was, if it was, it seems like it's clearly bigger than a half right now. Or whether it's going to be going up forever, uh, which of those cases is happening is not clear, but certainly isn't pointing to the average rank being half. So, Sarnak, Peter Sarnak, who is one of the, the conjectures, uh, is a colleague in Princeton. So, I went to him and I showed him this graph and said, how can you believe your conjecture that the average rank is a half? It's going higher and higher. And, and he has a lot of confidence. He says, oh, well, it's going to turn around clearly in the first half. <laughs> so, they have a lot of confidence in their conjecture. <laughs> okay, well, I certainly didn't believe it when I saw this, when I saw this graph. But the conjecture is due. So, uh, before even understanding whether the average rank is a half, it's nice to know whether the average rank is finite, because it's possible that the average rank is just getting higher and higher uh, as you're taking bigger and bigger coefficients in your elliptic curve. So, why is the average rank even finite? Well, the first theoretical evidence for, for the average rank being bounded uh, is due to Brumer. Uh, so, 1992 Brumer showed uh, that the if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis and the Bergson's running to that conjecture, that those two conjectures together can be used to show that the average rank must be bounded. So the way to say that is that uh, if you assume $2 million worth of conjectures, <laughs> then the average rank is bounded. But of course, people believe these two conjectures. And so if you believe those two conjectures, then you would believe that the average rank should be bounded. And that was the first theoretical evidence for it. For the boundedness of the average rank. Uh, and in fact, Boomer showed that if, if, if the generalized Riemann hypothesis and the Bergson square and the average conjecture are true, then the average rank must be bounded by 2.3. Uh, in 2004, Heath Brown, uh, still assuming GRH and BSD, still assuming those uh, two conjectures, improved this average rank to less than or equal to 2.0. And in 2009, uh, Young further improved this, again assuming GRH and BSD, to show that the average rank. Uh, is at most 1.79. And this was a significant uh, breakthrough from 2.0, because if the average rank is strictly less than 2, then that means that a positive proportion, at least, of curves have to have rank 0 or 1. Remember, the conjecture is that 100% of curves have rank 0 or 1, but at least the, uh, this last result is saying that a positive proportion of curves should have rank 0 or 1. Uh, but of course, these are all in GRH and BSD. So the first thing I want to talk about today is that it's now possible to give an unconditional proof that the average rank is bounded. Not assuming uh, any conjectures, but unconditional. So the first
first of all, my point was that uh, it's an unconditional proof of the finiteness of that refrain. So this is joint with uh, Earl Schenker. The theorem is that when elliptic curves, uh, y squared equals cubic polynomial, are ordered by the heights of these zero coefficients, the average rank is bounded. And in fact, what we can now show, uh, just as of a few months ago, is that the average rank is less than 0.89. And so the average rank in particular is less than 1. Uh, and since the average rank we can show is less than 1, it follows that when all of the two curves are ordered by height, a positive proportion of them have rank 0. Uh, at least 10% or 11% of them must have rank 0. And in particular, that means that a positive proportion, at least 11% of all of the curves, uh, have only finite and many rational points. So a positive proportion of elliptic curves, in fact, have no rational points, except for the point infinity. So the point I had before, that the finite t part, the finite root t part, is usually trivial. So the elliptic curve group, the of q, generally looks like z to the zero. It's just trivial. So a positive proportion of elliptic curves have absolutely no rational points, except for that point at infinity. OK, so that's what follows from this result. And so this was proven uh, just in the, a few months ago, although the boundedness of the average rank was proved in 2010, where we had obtained it down to 1.5, and gradually we've been chipping away at it, and now it's come below 1, which allows us to draw a number of these conclusions. Uh, so the average rank is less than 0.89. Uh, just last month, uh, so just in time for this conference, uh, we've been able to obtain an unconditional proof of the positivity of average rank. In other words, uh, we've shown that it's bounded away from 1, it's less than 1, we can now also show that it's bounded away from zero. So this is joint work with Chris Skinner, another colleague at Princeton. And the theorem is that when elliptic curves, y squared equals cubic and x are ordered by height, the average rank is strictly positive, strictly greater than zero. And the way we, we prove this is by proving actually this corollary. So actually we prove this corollary first. <laughs> and the corollary is that when all elliptic curves d over q are ordered by height, a positive proportion of them have rank one. And since the positive proportion at rank 1, the average rank must, of course, be bigger than 0. And so a consequence is that the positive proportion of elliptic curves have infinitely many rational points. So the two things that were conjectured uh, by Goldfeld and Katz that there should be a positive proportion having rank 0 and a positive proportion having rank 1, uh, they conjectured 50-50. We can now at least show that, well, a positive proportion at rank 0 has finitely many rational points and a positive proportion at rank 1, and does infinitely many rational points. And we get about 10% proportions uh, in both cases. OK, so both of the, the parts of the conjecture at least are true positive proportion of the time. Positive proportion of the time, they find many rational points. Positive proportion of the time, they're infinitely many rational points. Uh, the expected answer, of course, is 50-50, as long as you don't believe that graph that I showed you. OK, so that's the, that's the, these are the two results, the complementary results that I wanted to tell you about in the elliptic curve case. Uh, I should mention that, remember, m equals 3 and m equals 4 both correspond to the genus 1 case, right, where, you get, where your graph is the surface of a donut. And so the same results hold also uh, for m equals 4 to, if you look at y squared equals the quartic polynomial x, positive proportion will have no rational points, a positive proportion will have infinitely many rational points. And that also follows from these methods. So I mentioned the Bergson's Spooner and Dyer conjecture earlier. Remember that if we assumed the Bergson's Spooner and Dyer conjecture, then we could make many, and the generalized unit function, we could make many of these kinds of conclusions, uh, which we're now able to do unconditionally. And since we're able to do unconditionally, we can ask, well, what, the, what might these results say about the Bergson's Spooner and Dyer conjecture then? Uh, so let me just briefly say, well, what about analytic rank? So what does the Bergson's Spooner and Dyer conjecture say? What it, you know, what it says is that uh, this notion of analytic rank, what I defined for you earlier in terms of connecting the dots and defining p plus q and defining the group structure that way and saying how many generators do you need to generate that group, that's called the algebraic rank, or just the rank. There's another way of defining the rank of an elliptic curve uh, in terms of analysis, in terms of what are called L functions. So given an elliptic curve, uh, there's another way of defining the rank which is the order of vanishing at s equals 1 of a certain 
complex analytic function called the L function of the curve. And that's called the analytic rank, that invariant. And the Burton's Twitter to Dyer conjecture predicts that that analytic rank, defined in terms of analysis, is equal to the algebraic rank, which is defined just in terms of that elementary geometric construction of taking P and Q and, and making P plus Q, making that abelian group, and taking its rank of that abelian group. So that's a purely algebraic definition. This is a purely analytic definition. And amazingly, what the Burton's Twitter to Dyer conjecture predicts is that those two invariants of the elliptic curve are equal. The analytic rank is equal to the algebraic rank. So there's a purely analytic way of finding the rank of the elliptic curve without even looking for rational points and making that group. And the person's very good at you can just use analysis to predict what that rank is going to be, even without even looking at the group. Uh, so that's what the person's very good at you says, is that there's a purely analytic function that tells you the rank. Okay, the analytic rank is equal to the algebraic rank. So this is also an amazing conjecture, just like Falking's theorem connected topology and rational points. Burton's winner to direct conjecture connects analysis and algebra, analysis and rational points. Okay, so that's what the Burton's winner to direct conjecture says, that this analytic invariant of the elliptic curve, called the analytic rank, is equal to the algebraic rank that we've just defined. So if we combine our results, so the combined the results on, on, on this page, about a positive portion of the elliptic curves having no rational points, and into many rational points. We combine those results uh, with the recent work, uh, which is almost about to be published, of Skinner and Urbana, on the Iwasawa main conjecture for GL2. So that's one of the, these recent uh, conjectures that was resolved by Skinner and Urbana. Uh, we use that also in, connection, in, uh, in combination with the results on the previous slide, about a positive proportion of elliptic curves having no rational points and many rational points. We obtain, so this is joined with Harold Schenker, is that when all elliptic curves, e over q, are ordered by height, a positive portion of them have analytic rank zero and algebraic rank zero. So in other words, a positive proportion of elliptic curves have non-vanishing L function of s equals one. That's the definition of the analytic rank being zero. Uh, so the upshot is that, and also the analogous statements are also true for analytic rank. So in other words, what we're showing is that a positive proportion of elliptic curves have both algebraic and analytic rank zero and a positive portion of elliptic curves have both analytic and algebraic rank one. So in other words, a positive portion of elliptic curves satisfy the Burton's Spoon and Dyer conjecture. And not just for, and, it, and this, of course, this has two parts. They satisfy the Burton's Spoon and Dyer conjecture a positive portion of the time for width rank zero and a positive portion of the time with rank one. Both of those cases. And if we try to optimize the proportions right now, it's about 20 something percent. So at least 20 something percent of all elliptic curves satisfy the Burton's Spoon and Dyer conjecture. Uh, and previously was known for more than 0%. Okay, so that's, so those are the consequences in the case of elliptic curves. Uh, we're able to establish many cases of the Burton's Spoon and Dyer conjecture. Uh, okay, so now, what about general hyperelliptic curves? So right now we were looking at y squared equals cubic or y squared equals quartic polynomial in x. What about general hyperelliptic curves? So in the same way, we may order all hyperelliptic curves, y squared equals the degree m polynomial in x, okay, in the same way, namely by the height, defined by taking the maximum of the absolute values of the integer coefficients of your degree m polynomial. Okay, and suppose we order all hyperelliptic curves uh, by height, and we can ask, how many rational points do we typically have as we vary the hyperelliptic curve? Remember by Faulting's theorem, there are only finitely many rational points once your degree is at least five, which is the case we're now considering. Remember in the degree three and degree four case, uh, we did prove that a positive portion of the time there were infinitely many rational points. Uh, but once your degree is at least five, Faulting's theorem says that you can only have finitely many rational points. And so now the question is, what is the distribution of the number of this finite number of rational points? So by following the theorem, hyperelliptic curve, the gene is greater than one, that is n bigger than four, have only finitely many rational points, for sure. And so how many points do we expect a typical curve, a typical such curve to have? In other words, if we take uh, a random degree m polynomial where m is at least five, how many rational uh, square values does that polynomial take? In particular, you can ask how many integer square values does that polynomial take? And so the theorem is, that even though Falkland's theorem says that you only have finitely many rational points for every given curve, what should typically happen, what we show, is that typically your hyperelliptic curve will have no rational points at all. So uh, this is only proven for m greater than equal to 6 right now. m equals 5 is still open. 
that if you fix n greater than equal to 6, in other words, your degree of your polynomial to be at least 6, uh, then most, that is more than 50% of hyperelliptic curves of degree n, have no rational points. In other words, if you pick a random polynomial of degree at least 6 with integer coefficients, uh, better than 50, 50 odd, that you're not going to have any rational points. And moreover, as the degree goes to infinity, the, more, for the density of hyperelliptic curves having no rational points approaches 100% as the degree goes to infinity. So in other words, if you pick a random polynomial uh, with integer coefficients and your degree is large, uh, it's going to be very hard for it to have any rational points. Uh, most, more, yeah, almost 100% probability uh, you're going to have no rational points on your, on your hyperelliptic curve. In other words, the chance that a random polynomial of large degree takes a square value is basically zero. So this is joint work uh, with Gross, uh, together with work with Kunin and Still, and then it all, uh, and then the final ingredient is in a preprint, uh, which was just put up on the archive uh, a couple days ago, just in time for this conference, really. Okay, so that's available. That's available on the, uh, on the archive. It's called Most High Elliptic Curves Have No Rational Points. Okay, so the upshot is that if you pick a random hyperelliptic curve, or you pick, and it's 100% probability, basically, that's not going to have any rational points. If you pick a random polynomial with integer coefficients of large degree, uh, probability is very close to 0%. Uh, that it's not going to take a, uh, that's going to take a square value. 0% so probability that it will take a square value. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the case for general hyperelliptic curves. So remember, for elliptic curves, we saw that a positive portion of the time you have infinite many rational points positive proportion of the time you have finally many rational points, but once you're in genuine hyperelliptic territory, in other words, once the degree of your polynomial is at least five, or at least six, uh, then chances are you're going to have no rational points. Your polynomial is not going to take any square values. Okay, that's the theory. Uh, this has a consequence uh, for what's called uh, the Hassel principle in number theory, a very important principle uh, that's guided uh, a lot of number theory for many years. The reason being that it's very, very important when one is studying quadratic equations. So the Hassett local global principle for quadratic forms says that a quadratic form, in other words, a quadratic polynomial in the n plus 1 variables, uh, takes uh, the value 0 uh, when you put in rational numbers into the arguments, if and only if it has, it takes the value 0 on n for every n. So a quadratic form takes the value 0 if and only if it takes the value 0 mod n for all n. Uh, the way number theorists often say that is with piadic integers, uh, or with the piadic numbers. So in other words, if you're familiar with the piadic numbers, you can say that a quadratic polynomial has a non-trivial 0 if and only if it has a non-trivial 0 over the piadic numbers for all p and over the real numbers. But a more elementary way to say is that a quadratic form takes the value 0 if and only if it takes the value 0 mod n for all n. And that's something that's very easy to check. Mod n is very easy to check whether a polynomial takes uh, the value 0. And so for quadratic polynomials, it's very easy to tell whether it takes the value 0 because you just have to check mod n for every n. And if there's an obstruction mod n for some n, then therefore there can't be uh, 0 over z over k. So the way number theory say this is f of f is equal to 0 has a non trivial solution globally if and only if it does locally. Globally means in the rational numbers, locally means mod n for all n. And this principle is indeed what, what lies behind much of the rich arithmetic theory of quadratic polynomials. Uh, and this is the principle that really has allowed uh, number theorists to fully understand quadratic polynomials and what values they take uh, just by understanding things mod n. So this is the Hasse principle, one of the guiding principles of, of number theory in solving equations. And the next natural question is to what extent, so this is a question that's also been of great importance in number theory, is to what extent does the Hasse principle hold for cubic or higher degree forms? Okay, for quadratic forms, it does hold, and that's Hasse's theorem. But for cubic or higher degree forms, can you just check mod n to tell whether they're solutions? Well, if the number of variables is large compared to the degree, uh, then the Hasse principle holds. So that's, that's a theorem uh, that basically follows from the work of Ramanujan and Hardy and Littlewood on the circle method. So if you have many variables compared to the degree, then the Hasse principle holds. In other words, if you want to know whether uh, a, 
polynomial with lots and lots of variables compared to the degree takes the value zero. You just have to check mod n for every n, and that's, that's sufficient. But of course, in the case that we're talking about, hyperlooped curves, there are only two variables, x and y. And so it's not clear uh, from such methods, like the circle method, whether we could expect the house principle to hold in general for such curves. Right? If you only have two variables, then is it sufficient to check mod n for your solution uh, to decide whether you actually have a solution in the rational numbers or in the integers? Well, it's not hard to show that the vast majority of hyperelliptic curves, and the way we are ordering them, if we take y squared equals a polynomial in x and we order them by the size of the coefficients, it's not hard to show that the vast majority do have solutions mod n for every n. Uh, in other words, they have points everywhere locally. But since we've shown that most hyperelliptic curves have no rational points, uh, it follows that most, that is more than 50% of hyperelliptic curves of genus at least one, fail to have in fact, you can get a positive proportion even for genus equal to 1. Whereas the genus, when the genus is 0, that's Hassel's theorem that it always satisfies the Hassel, Hassel principle. So genus 0 curves, that is quadratic hyperelliptic curves, always satisfy the Hassel principle. But what this theorem is saying is that Hassel's theorem fails to hold once the genus is at least 1. And in fact, it fails most of the time. So you can't check for rational solutions just by checking mod n for hyperelliptic curves. The Hassel principle fails uh, for most curves once the degree is at least 5 or 6. Uh, by similar methods, we can also now show that a positive proportion of plane cubics, in other words, cubic forms and three variables, cubic polynomials and three variables, fail the Hassel principle. So uh, all these kinds of results uh, lead naturally to results about Hassel principle, uh, which tells us how you can look for rational points, uh, or how you can't look for rational points, rather. OK, so most hyperlipid curves don't have any rational points, and therefore most of them fail the Hassel principle. Okay, so I just want to spend a minute or so on the method of proof. <laughs> Although the methods behind the proofs of all these theorems vary, they do have one very important common feature. Namely, in each case, uh, what we do is we identify, so for if you're looking to solve the equation y squared equals a sextic polynomial, what we do is we, we identify a suitable representation, V, of an algebraic group G that's defined over C. Okay, so it's just a group acting on a vector space. We look for an appropriate group acting on a vector space, and then we find an explicit mapping from rational points on our curve to lattice points in the vector space. So we look for a map from rational points on our curve to lattice points in the vector space up to the action of the group. And I'll, I'll make this all very concrete in a second. And so once we have a map from rational points to lattice points in a vector space, then we can use geometry of numbers to show that, that such lattice points are rare in the space. So we show that such lattice points in VR in, in our vector space up to, up to the equivalents of the group are rare. So the number of lattice points that you get uh, is not very many compared to the number of curves that you're talking about. And that's what allows you to show that so combining the fact that you have a map from rational points to lattice points combined with the fact that there aren't that many lattice points uh, that could be obtained. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what allows us to show that most hyperelliptic curves, or whatever kind of curve we're talking about, don't have rational points. And this is sort of a new method uh, that's turned out to be quite powerful in showing the non-existence of algebraic objects. You find a map uh, of your algebraic object into lattice points in the vector space, and then use geometry of numbers to say that there aren't so many lattice points in the regions that you're talking about. So I want to show you one such map. It's very concrete. So suppose we're interested in genus 2 curves. In other words, y squared equals a degree 6 polynomial in x. Okay. So the relevant group there is SL6 acting on pairs of symmetric 6 by 6 matrices. Okay. And suppose we have a rational point on y squared equals a degree 6 polynomial. Now I'm going to show you a way of producing a pair of 6 by 6 matrices that are associated to that rational point. So Without loss of generality, you can assume that that rational point is happening where x equals 0, and y squared uh, is then equal to a6. So a6 is a square. Right? So a6 is c squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to associate to this rational point 0, comma c on our hyperelliptic curve a pair of symmetric matrices given as follows. So given this rational point 0, comma c on our hyperelliptic curve, right, when we plug in x equals 0, we get a6, which we've assumed to be c squared then we make the following pair of symmetric 6 by 6 matrices. 
And this symmetric pair of six by six matrices, they're symmetric matrices, they're six by six, and they have the property that if you call the first one A and the second one B, and if you take determinant of AX minus B, you get exactly your polynomial back. So if you were to take determinant of the first matrix times X minus the second matrix, you take the determinant, you would get exactly this polynomial. And the interesting thing here is that we really needed A6 to be a square in order to make that second matrix, right? Because, well, notice we have those Cs, the two Cs on the diagonal, which are causing the determinant of the right matrix to be A6. We really needed that square root. And on the other hand, what, could, what one could show is that most polynomials, most degree six polynomials, do not have such a, such a pair of six by six matrices whose determinant, AX minus BY, gives you a polynomial. But when it does take a square value, you can produce such a pair of six by six matrices. And those two facts together say that most degree six polynomials cannot take a square value. Because if it did take a square value, you can produce such a pair of matrices whose determinant gives you your polynomial. But on the other hand, we show by geometry of numbers arguments that for a general polynomial, degree six polynomial, such matrices A and B don't exist as the determinant of AX minus B is equal to your polynomial. And that's really the idea of the proof. Okay, so I'll just end by, by summarizing. So a hyperelliptic curve over Q is given by an equation of the form y squared equals the degree m polynomial, where the coefficients are integers. The case m equals 3 gives elliptic curves where the rational points in the form of group. And in joint work with Arl Shankar and Chris Skinner, uh, we show that the average rank of elliptic curves is greater than 0, strictly greater than 0, and strictly less than 1. And therefore, a positive portion of elliptic curves have rank zero, and therefore no rational points. And a positive portion of elliptic curves have rank one, and thus infinitely many rational points. And these same results continue to hold also for m equals four. And one thing I want to mention here is that if these methods uh, continue to work the way they are, they do converge to the conjecture that half of all elliptic curves have rank zero and half have rank one. So remember I was saying I was skeptical of the conjecture originally due to the data, I'm now a believer in the conjecture. Uh, because there is theoretical evidence coming from our methods that leads to the same conjecture. And so I actually do believe that that curve, that graph is going to turn around and approach half. And there's theoretical evidence from, from this point of view uh, also now uh, that's pointing to that same thing. Um, and then joint work with Dick Gross, Kuhn and Stoll, and then the new preprint. Uh, is that from m bigger than 5, most, that is more than 50% of hyperelliptic curves in degree m, have no rational points uh, at all. Uh, and moreover, as the degree goes to infinity, a density approaching 100% of hyperelliptic curves have absolutely no rational points. So if you take a random polynomial with very high degree, it's a 100% chance, a density approaching 100% chance that it will have no rational points. So if you take a large degree polynomial, the chance is 0% that it'll take a square value. And, and so in particular, if you take an integer polynomial at random, even it's not going to have integral points, so it's not going to take integer square values either, since it won't take rational square values. And finally, for g bigger than 1, most, that is more than 50% of hyperelliptic curves over q of deems g fail the Haas principle, and in fact approaching 100% as the degree goes to infinity. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your time.